today, I'm getting on a plane. But not just any old plane. I'm... What are you doing? Well, you're not going on holiday without me and Mr Grumbles. We've been looking forward to a little time in the sun. Zon, we are not going on holiday. I am getting on a special kind of plane, one that turns into a hospital. Oh, I see. This is awkward. Will you be needing this? No, I won't, Zant. It's time for Investigation Ouch. Today, I'm at RAF Bryce Norton, the largest RAF station in the UK. Home to the RAF's tactical medical wing. Meet the flight medical team. And Sergeant Chris is part of this heroic crew. Chris, what is the Tactical Medical Wing? So the Tactical Medical Wing will provide medical support to personnel all around the world. This kind of medical care is really complex. How do you train for it? So we'll do a practical scenario on board a real aircraft, like we're going to do today. Can I have a look? Absolutely. Fantastic. This is the C-17. At about 53 metres long and wide, it's almost twice the size of a blue whale. This plane not only needs to carry everything from tanks to helicopters, troops to supplies, amazingly, it also doubles up as a hospital. So you can see behind me, they're building these stretcher stanchions to act almost as bunks for patients. But the remarkable thing is that it can support the most severely injured patients of all, people who need life support. It only takes 10 minutes to turn this plane into a hospital. We're in Nepal. It might not look much like Nepal, but that's where today's scenario is taking place. So some military personnel were on an expedition, there's been an earthquake, and they have different levels of injury. And they're being treated to get them ready and fit to fly. This casualty has two broken legs, but there are other patients with even more serious injuries, and they're whisked away to the plane. So Mary's had a head injury that she got in the earthquake, and so she's now fully stabilised. She's got a neck brace on to keep her spine stable, and she's got an oxygen mask. And the team are now putting on monitors so that she can be cared for in exactly the same way that she would be in a big hospital in the UK. It is totally remarkable. If this was a real situation, we'd now take off and head home with the casualties. So unlike the kind of aircraft that you may have been on, all the seats are along the side, and that creates space in the middle either for cargo or for patients. We are now at maximum altitude. You can go along with your business. During the flight, the medics keep the patient stable and safe. So because Mary's got a head injury and she may have other severe injuries, the team have put her in this amazing vacuum mattress, which is full of little polystyrene balls. They've sucked the air out of it, and now this is squeezing her, and partly it protects her from the effects of being in a bumpy aeroplane. It'll make her more comfortable and make her injuries less likely to get worse. How are you feeling, Mary? I'm all right, sir. You're all right. It's amazing that patients can be treated exactly as if they were in hospital, except they're thousands of feet up in the air. Training like this is fantastically important for getting things right in a real emergency. And these guys have done such a good job that I've basically completely forgot that we weren't in the air until I look out the window. Yep, that's definitely not Nepal. Ouch. Amazing people do lots of important jobs inside and outside hospitals that help to keep you safe. But what will happen when we have a go? I feel a bit silly. This is Operation Takeover. Can you guess who today's hero is? Well, I'll give you a clue. They might save you if you're wearing one of these. And these. And some of these. <laughs> well, it's lucky I was wearing my swimming trunks today. Did you guess it? We're about to take over the job of today's hero, lifeguard Donna. Being a lifeguard isn't just about watching out for rule breakers like Zand, it's about saving lives. Donna's a lifeguard training manager, so she's an expert in spotting swimmers in trouble and giving medical attention for all sorts of injuries. Common things are nosebleeds, people that run down the side of the pool, slip over. We might have people that can't really swim very well, so we might have to do minor rescues. We might have some older swimmers that may have heart conditions. We go right from the very mundane to the life-threatening and serious. So we're going to be lifeguards later. What do we need to know? So a big one is communicating. We'd use the whistle. One short whistle blast gets the attention of a bather. 
two short whistle blasts. I need to talk to another member of my lifeguard team, get their attention for something in the pool. And then three short whistle blasts. I might need to go in and do a rescue and I need to tell everybody that's where I'm going. Can I have a green whistle? If you like, yes. Well, thank goodness for that. Next tip, use a really high chair to get a brilliant view. The lifeguards are constantly watching the pool. We use scanning patterns as well, so we might do a side-to-side -side motion, they might do up and down the pool. They're constantly changing the way they're doing things to keep themselves aware. And finally, for more serious cases, use the really important rescue board to help get casualties out of the water safely. We're really worried more about spinal injury, so by having them on a board, we've got them supported and we can strap them so they don't move anymore. We're not going to make that injury any worse. The lifeguards secure the straps gently but tightly around the casualty to prevent causing more injury. Thanks, Donna. There's a lot to remember. We've seen how important the lifeguards are at keeping us safe while we're swimming and how they respond to emergencies. But how will Chris and I do when we're thrown in the deep end? Get it? Get it? It's time for us to take over as lifeguards. Our challenge is to spot if someone's in danger. Use the correct whistle signals to alert the other lifeguards to help and use the rescue board to get a swimmer with a suspected spinal injury out of the water quickly and safely. Sean, have you got a handle on the different whistle signals? Go on, test me, test me. It's lunchtime. This could be embarrassing. With extra poolside lifeguards on hand to keep swimmers safe, Donna will be judging our every move and picking a winner. Chris, you're up first. Lifeguard Kieran is pretending to be an injured swimmer. Will Chris spot him? He got the right number of whistles on that one. Three whistles means he's on his way in. What are you doing now, Chris? So I almost strapped Sam to the board. Sam's just one of the lifeguards helping, not the patient. Sorry, Sam. Ah, oh, beginner's error, eh, hey, Donna? Head strap's a little bit slow. Uh-oh. Quicker, Chris. He's not doing too well at the moment. Oh, dear. You need a strong finish here, Chris. What do you think, Donna? These are a little bit on the loose side. A bit loose, really. A bit loose. These are really loose. Oh, really? Well, that's not good. Time to move aside, Chris, and watch how the master does it. Yeah, right. Your turn. Here comes our fake casualty. Have you seen him, Zand? Zand? Zond! Oh, oh, oh! Two whistles to get the other lifeguard's attention. He's spotted him, he's given the right signals. And another three to say he's on his way. He's run right past the board. Oh, Zond. That's not good. He's quickly got this chest strap on, and now he's going for the head strap. Really jerking those straps into place now. Whoa there, careful! Oh. This is going to be a tight contest. Time to see who came out on top. A few things from both of you. Chris, you started off really well. It all fell apart a little bit when you got the board in, though. And then when we lifted out, the straps were quite loose. But, Zan, it was a little bit the other way around for you. The guy was face down in the water for quite a while before you reactive. You ran right past the board and had to come back for it. But putting it in didn't go too badly. So, your verdict for today, guys? It's a draw. A draw? We were both equally amazing. Yes, or equally rubbish. We learned a lot today, but I would say that overall, Donna, it is best if we leave it to the experts. Zand, let's hand our whistles back. Ooh. Oh. 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 Uh, Zand, where have you been? on a mountain climbing expedition. I wanted to look at the effects of low oxygen levels on the human body. This is something that could really help patients. Well, that's true, but why did you have to go up a mountain? Uh, because, Chris, at the top of mountains, there isn't very much oxygen. Did you know there is also a place in London where you can study exactly the same thing? It's a lab, and I'm going there right now. Time for investigation, ouch! I'm visiting the Extreme Everest team at University College London to find out why they're researching how some people are better than others at surviving with low oxygen levels. 
Here to tell us what they do is Dr Denny Levitt. We are a group of doctors who actually work in intensive care looking after very sick patients. Patients in intensive care have very serious illnesses and often have low levels of oxygen in their blood. What we find with our patients, sadly, is that some people perform much better when their oxygen levels are low than others. And we need to understand that process better. Having low oxygen levels is called hypoxia. Your body needs a constant supply of oxygen. And if the levels drop, your tissues and organs stop functioning. So if these doctors can learn how healthy bodies survive on low oxygen levels, it could unlock some treatments to help ill patients with hypoxia. Now, because it's so hard to do science on severely ill patients, the team here used themselves in experiments, as well as some select volunteers. This facility has special equipment which allows the team to recreate low oxygen levels normally found at high altitude, up mountains. And today, I'm going to be taking part in an experiment to see how my body copes with low oxygen levels. For the first part of the test, I'm in a room with normal levels of oxygen. I'm fitted with monitors so Dr Denny can see how my body copes when exercising. OK, Chris, off you go. I'm going to cycle as hard as I can for six minutes. Remember, this first test is at normal levels of oxygen. So, how's he doing, Dr Denny? The 99 is the oxygen levels in his blood. Normal is anywhere between 95 and 100. You're so normal, Chris. Well done. OK, Chris, you can stop there now. You've done the full six minutes. Mm. Well done. So we can see that the oxygen levels in your blood are still normal. So even though... I'm totally out of breath and exhausted. I haven't been unable to get oxygen. Exactly. Next, I'm going to do the same thing in a special chamber that's had 50% of the oxygen removed. The same as being 5,000 metres in altitude. That's like being over halfway up Mount Everest. What would happen if I stayed in this room overnight? Well, the oxygen levels are such that actually if you stayed here for a long period of time, you would feel very unwell. Best to get this experiment started, then. So, OK, Chris, you can start when you're ready. I'm doing the same six-minute workout as I did outside the chamber, but after only a couple of minutes, I'm feeling the effects of the lack of oxygen in the room. So we can hear Chris breathing heavily already. We can see his oxygen levels have started to drop. That's way below normal. And you can see Chris is finding this quite hard work now. Keep going if you can, Chris. I'm really struggling. It's much, much harder work with less oxygen. Chris's oxygen levels, as you can see, are getting lower and he's finding it hard. And I'm going to stop you there, Chris. <laughs> that was unbelievably horrible. Like many sick patients in intensive care, my body struggled to cope with low oxygen levels. We need to study people who adapt quickly and people who don't adapt so well, so we can see what the difference between them is. Although it's in the early stages of research, by studying results like mine with other people who coped better with low oxygen levels, scientists like Denny hope to create new treatments that will help the sickest patients in hospital, those who are suffering with a lack of oxygen. Ouch! Chris, I cannot wait any longer. I am bursting to know what's happening at A&E. Aren't you? Yes. Well, let's head back there, then. Right, come on, let's go! <laughs> Waiting with her mum in Sheffield Children's Emergency Department is five-year-old Megan with a nasty knock on her noggin. Gross alert coming up. I'm waiting to see the doctor. Well, let's find out what happened. It was a beautiful sunny day, and Megan was outside a pub garden walking along a wall like a black cat ready to pounce. Meow! Um, I guess so. Or a tightrope walker at the circus. Um, wibbly wobbly. Now you're getting carried away, Zahn. Megan was walking along a low wall. OK. When she got to the end of the wall, she walked down some steps. But as she turned round to go back up, she tripped and fell head first, banging her head. Ouch! Nipples bleeding. Here to check out that banged bonce is Dr Robert Eastman. When anyone's had a head injury, it's important to assess the nerves coming out of the brain to make sure that they've not been affected. 
So, Dr. Robert first checks the nerves that control Megan's eye movement. And then all the way down, had a look in her ears, had a look in her nose. That's to make sure that if someone falls over that they've not injured anything inside the nose. Megan passes Dr. Robert's tests with flying colours. Now it's time to inspect the wound. I feel down your head here, does that feel OK? Yeah, just look up for me. Uh, what's going on here? Keep your eye on Megan's wandering fingers. Busted! So I was just pressing with my hands to make sure the skin would go back together so we can steri strip the wounds and that'll close it up nicely. Megan heads off to get those steri strips stuck on. But there's something worrying her. It's only going to be cold water. It's not cold water that's troubling Megan, Mum. I don't want my socks on. You don't want your socks on? Is that going to affect your head? <laughs> Everyone knows wearing socks affects your head, Mum. Right, I'm going to start with the bit where it's not cut. We'll get all this blood nice off. Still. With those steri strips stuck on, the skin on Megan's head will start to heal straight away. She'll be back to normal in no time. And her socks are back on. So, Megan, what have you learnt today? I've learnt to be more careful. Hopefully. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Bye. Bye. Bye.